introduce yourself and your title. My name is George Papandreou, um, former Prime Minister of Greece, uh, right now head of the Socialist International. Wonderful. Uh, so, so let me, I want to talk about ancient Greece before that, uh, uh, recent Greece. Um, uh, Greece, of course, the birthplace of democracy, but in many respects has been on the front line of democracy. It's gone through this difficult decade-long challenge of, of a financial crisis. Uh, but democracy has proved remarkably resilient over that time. Um, so what lessons can be taken uh, from the experience of Greece over the last decade for democratic countries all around the world? One of the experiences from the financial crisis in Greece is that, first of all, we are very interconnected. Um, so the financial crisis in Greece, even though it started there, actually started in Wall Street, but it started, the sovereign debt crisis started in Greece, uh, had repercussions throughout the world. And, uh, but at the same time, in dealing with this in Greece, and I was prime minister then, uh, I realized that uh, I could not deal with it alone. Our politics are, have become uh, much more difficult because the issues we deal with are not local only, they are not national only. As a matter of fact, they're global. And the uh, markets are global, the, uh, the problems are global, and uh, we need to work together if we want to mitigate problems or solve them or, or lead in the world. And uh, this is where the European Union played an important role, initially very slow, initially with initially not re realizing that this was a European problem, a Euro problem, but also even a global problem, uh, where the markets were very jittery. Uh, and uh, that, of course, created a lot of pain. But in the end, coming to the aid of Greece so that we could um, make sure we don't go bankrupt. Uh, so I think what we, what one of my, my um, uh, one of the lessons that, that I would take from this is that we need to, yes, strengthen our democracies at the local level, but we also need to see how we can work together at the regional and global level if we want to um, mitigate some of the major issues, major crises, or be able to shape our planet uh, in a way which is um, serving our, our citizens in the best of ways. Wonderful. And, and looking at on the regional level, uh, obviously not just Greece went through a crisis, but Europe went through and in many respects continues to go through a crisis in democracy. And you have different arguments that it moved too far, too fast in terms of developing the European Union. You have other arguments that it didn't move fast enough and it wasn't democratic enough. Where do you see the European Union now? Um, and how does it cope with this sort of uh, divisions that exist to, to reinvigorate the European project? The financial crisis uh, in Europe brought out uh, a number of issues. First of all, there were, I think, false narratives or maybe false news, you could call it, fake news, which was quite apparent. For example, when Greece was going through a crisis, it was very easy, other countries, and even politicians and well-known politicians, to say, ah, yes, Greece is in a crisis because Greeks are lazy. Uh, I looked up the data. Greeks work more hours than any other European. Uh, but of course, when you have this vision of going to Greece to a beautiful island, dancing, Uzo's, Uzo, Zorba, wine, and so on, then you have a vision of, of, of an easy, uh, lackadaisical life. But it's not so. People are working very hard. So that was, a, that was, that was a, 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 it created a stereotype inside Europe of um, a division along national or ethnic lines, along cultural lines. I think that also fed into what later became the sort of demagoguery and fear of the other. How can we be in the same house? How can we be in the same bed? And we're so different. Um, and I think we need to restore a sense of solidarity and a sense of commonality in face of the types of challenges we're, le we're, we're facing in, in, around the world. Uh, secondly, I think that Europe um, needs to integrate more. We actually, uh, when we do work as one, we are effective. And people do want to have effective governance. Uh, for example, when uh, Mario Draghi of the ECB, uh, with the support of the countries, did come out and say, he will do, I will do whatever it takes to stop the crisis, and I will intervene in the markets, the markets calmed down. So it showed that Europe, when it works in unison, can actually mitigate some of the problems we were facing. Um, 
recently with the new laws around the internet and privacy. Uh, this is an act where it showed that when Europe does take a stance and does legislate, it will affect not only Europe, but it will affect uh, the global uh, situation in that particular area. So being coming together is a strong force. Uh, at the same time, integrating more has another problem. People will say, well, more and more decisions are being made far away from me. They're being made in Brussels. They're being made by certain bureaucrats or some somewhat opaque decision-making process. That's where I think we need, at the same time, a more democratizing process inside Europe. So if we do integrate more to have more efficient and, and, and a greater capacity to deal with problems, we also need to democratize more to make sure that people feel that this is a people's project, a citizen's project. It's not some elite out there making decisions. And to do that, we have to be innovative. We have to think of how democracy is going to look at beyond borders. How can we work together, but in a democratic way? How are we going to elect a, a president you know, beyond our nations in the European Union? How are we going to do something like citizen juries, where we will have citizens from all of our countries um, through lottery, possibly, come up with, ask them to come up with ideas or represent sort of many publics of what the whole demos of Europe will be and uh, able to deliberate. Uh, are we going to have different types of referenda, not only in one country, but maybe Europe-wide, where you have sort of a double majority, where you need to have a, a majority of um, votes, but also a majority of countries to pass something. So these are new ideas, and I think uh, the um, experimentation which uh, could be going on, and I hope will be going on in, in Europe, as far as both integrating and democratizing, will be a model for other parts of the world. You use two words, uh, democracy and demagoguery, which of course come out of ancient Greece. Uh, and the ancients thought about a lot of the challenges we're thinking about now. So what can we learn from their debates about the debates we're having today about the future of democracy? Well, one of the things that the ancients, I think, uh, uh, showed was that, or discovered was that politics was uh, not a dirty word, but it was a word where uh, more of a revelation that we can actually control our fate. We don't have to defer to some tyrant or to some priest, high priest, or, or gods or something. We actually, as human beings, can control our fate, imagine a better world, and actually materialize a better world. Uh, and I think we need to bring back that spirit of politics, of being able to believe that we can control our fate and that we can uh, change the world in a way we want to imagine it being changed. And then democracy was, was, was invented, if you like, uh, as an innovation. Uh, an innovation to make sure that there was no abuse of power, that not one person or one caste or one class could take power and abuse it. Uh, abuse of power was uh, hubris, uh, it was anathema to the gods. Uh, but also a way of collectively making decisions. Uh, the, so how do we make sure that um, we deal with concentration of power today? And we are seeing huge concentration of power. Uh, and this is uh, not only within our countries, but at this sort of global level, where you have, um, whether it's finance, whether it is um, pharma, whether it is agro, energy or the digital platforms, huge concentration of power, huge concentration of wealth, and through that also capture of politics, uh, our democratic institutions, our media, uh, whether it's through legal corruption called lobbying or whether it's through outright corruption, we are seeing this and that's undermining the sense of democracy. So how do we make sure that we control this power? Secondly, how do we make sure that um, uh, we deal with the inequality that's being developed, that's being seen as huge inequality. And that was another area where ancient Greece, uh, the ancient Greeks, Aristotle and Plato talked about. They said, well, two things undermine democracy. Une inequality, where there are divisions and polarization, we're seeing that in many countries, and polarization then leading to possible violence, uh, 
um, or what we would call populism today, uh, and demagoguery, which also leads to um, false promises, basically, people being frustrated, and then also creating uh, major conflict within societies. And the two of the um, remedies that the ancient Greeks had, one was the re redistributive capacity of society, so that, yes, the rich do have to have a, a social contract with uh, the rest of society, uh, and therefore, yes, there will be richer people, but there will also be people with basic incomes, basic needs covered, uh, time to actually be part of society, and education, education to fight as a, through a critical mind, to be able to think critically towards authority, towards what you hear, what you, somebody else is telling you, today maybe fake news, critically be able to assess through education, and therefore the development of theater, of arts, of, 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 um, of games, is very much part of learning, uh, but even more so participating in politics. Um, in ancient Greek citizens, over their life, at least twice took on public roles, uh, either through lottery or elected, and they learned through participating, through taking on responsibilities, through owning the process, and therefore it became much less to be uh, swayed by a demagogue. So I think these are lessons we could we could um, we could take from the ancient Greeks, and I, I could add I could add more. I, when I was prime minister, I was in, in inspired by what ancient Greeks did with uh, by they posted every expenditure that was that the, that the polis the city did, but they did it. Of course, they didn't have the internet. They put it on stone. Mm -hmm. I decided, why don't I use the internet and use it as a wall where you just post everything. Uh, there were all our expenditures, so I just passed a law that said no um, expenditure is legal unless it's posted on the internet. And that way we brought in a lot of transparency, which is very important for democracy and for citizens to be able to hold uh, politicians and government uh, accountable. Uh, I think also another idea of the Agora, where everybody got together to discuss and then decide, that was one spot. Today we have the internet, but it's splintered. People go into their own little tribes and their cocoons and don't really discuss with each other, but against each other. Could we create a, a forum, a, a government forum, a, a fourth branch of government in one, in one sense, which is, um, uh, allows and, and gives the right to everybody to deliberate on the laws and on the issues that have to be decided by our legislature or, or by our executive, and in that way bring everybody together in one space where they have to debate with the other side, and uh, somehow that is a moderating force, but also will be a force in helping look for solutions rather than just finding an enemy. Uh, so these, I think, are some ideas we should go back to and think through and see how they apply to our world today. It's wonderful. Um, so when we look forward, uh, obviously not just Greece and not just Europe are going through a crisis in many respects, but the whole democratic world, the United States included, perhaps most extreme. Um, looking forward, um, you know, how, how is your faith for the future of democracy? Where do you see uh, it developing and have to develop, um, not just for this generation, but for the next generation? Well, I've been asked many times about the future of democracy, or as a matter of fact, people saying, well, does democracy really work? And um, <clears throat> my answer is usually, well, what is the other system that works better? Uh, are we going to give up our rights to decide for our fate to some higher authority, to some technocrat, to some dictator, to some authoritarian figure that is supposedly knowing better than us uh, about what should be done. So are we going to let other people decide our fate? I think we have to have the basic principle that we can decide on our fate. But how do we do this collectively is a question, and particularly in a globalizing world. I think what's happened is that as we're in a globalizing world and it's become much more complicated, complex, interdependent, uh, and therefore politics uh, less effective, or representative governments, less representative democracy less effective, 
we need to do, um, we need to see how we, how we harness globalization in a way. I think one reaction we've seen is this authoritarianism. People say, oh, since we can't really solve things, since things aren't really moving, let's find a strong figure to make decisions. Yeah, but that strong figure in the end could make, figure could make the decisions against the will or against the public good. Um, others will say, well, let's go back to our little tribe. You know, let's go back to our country. We don't want to be interconnected with the world. So that was sort of like what, the, what Britain did with Brexit. Go back to our island. Well, I'd like to do that in Greece very often, go to my little island and drink my wine and eat my fish and swim and so on. But all of a sudden, I'll see the next day thousands of refugees come onto that island or uh, at the bottom of the sea, ancient ruins, but also a lot of modern ruins, plastic bottles, and, uh, or migration of fish from tropical areas changing our ecosystem. So we really are not, not islands in this global situation. So I don't see the, this return to this nationalist way of thinking. We do need to strengthen our nations, but in a way which will allow us to cooperate much more and somehow regulate the uh, globalizing world. If you like, uh, in the previous century, um, there was a social contract which, which was humanizing capitalism, and that was called social democracy. Um, uh, and we now have to find how we humanize globalization. Uh, that is some rules and regulations to allow us to work together in a, in a peaceful way. Uh, I think uh, that is what my hope would be. Uh, on the one hand, strengthening people's participation at the local level, at the national level, so they do have a say, but also see how that say, that voice, reaches a global level where we can say, yes, we do have different nations, different cultures, but there is a minimum of standards we want to hold out as sacrosanct for all of humanity. Wonderful. And then the final question that, you know, you're now doing this amazing work with Socialist International. Can you, can you speak about that and, and how uh, that organization is envisioning democracy? The Socialist International is a, uh, an alliance of social democrat um, labor parties from around the world, uh, somewhere over 150 parties. We are the biggest political organization affiliated also with United Nations. And our basic core principles are, first of all, democracy. We are a democratic movement. Uh, many of the parties that uh, have uh, our members have grown out of fighting dictatorships, fighting authoritarian regimes, and embedding democratic practices in, in, in society. The second would be social justice, a sense that um, we are producing, we're producing a lot of wealth, amazing capacities of, of humanity today, but it's... Um, not shared well. It's not, um, uh, there, are, as there are many uh, losers, there are a few super winners, uh, and, and there's huge inequality, but there are many losers also. How do we make sure that um, we have both, we have sort of a win-win situation? Well, yes, you will have the richer, but you also have people that feel comfortable, safe, they, ha they have prospects for education, they have a prospect for a, a good pension, they have prospects for their uh, a good job and wages, um, and how do we deal with the new developments where the labor market will change a lot, robotics, artificial intelligence, and so on, uh, where we may need to think about different types of, of life. Maybe we need, need to have people have more leisure, be more creative, be more artful and artistic, uh, think about social work and community work more. Uh, so the question of how we structure our society to make it socially just is a second really, really important point at the national and at the global level. And a third issue, which is, 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 a, is a, a newer one in, in, um, in politics uh, of the last decades, is the environment. That we have to have a, a, a balance between um, uh, the human growth or the growth of, of our economies and in the environment in a way which means we have to really th rethink our, uh, our economic models uh, so they will be sustainable uh, and they also will uh, protect the preciousness of our environment for future generations. So these are the three basic principles which guide our, our work and uh, we believe that um, social democracy is uh, a, a, a hope for the future because what we're saying is yes, we 
are in a market system, but we need to regulate it in a way which makes sure that there is social justice, there is a sense of real participation, and we're also protecting our sustainable sustainability of our planet. Wonderful. Is there anything else you'd like to add? So much, but I think this is fine. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay.